Well, I'd like to thank um, the department for inviting me to speak here today. It really is uh, actually very thrilling for me uh, to come out here and address you. And I'm going to talk to you about a story that's been evolving in our laboratory uh, for the past several years uh, on some of the um, maybe less appreciated immunological sequelae of transfusion across minor antigens. Um, normally, I fairly mobile and gesticulate about, but today I'm tethered by this microphone. So if, my, if I jerk about, I apologize for that. So in the United States, transfusion is really a very common uh, event. We transfuse uh, 15 units, give or take, of red cells a year alone uh, into roughly 5 million recipients, which comes down to about one in every 70 Americans. And uh, even school children are well aware of the A, B, O antigens and probably the D antigens as well. But if you look uh, comprehensively, I guess, at, at the antigens we've described thus far, there are three to 400 different blood group antigens uh, that have been described depending on how exactly you categorize them. So every transfusion, except for an autologous transfusion, is a very complicated immunological stimulus to the recipient. Now, the carbohydrate antigens are well known because they cause scary outcomes when you ignore them, like ABO. But the vast majority of these antigens, essentially uh, almost all of them, are single amino acid polymorphisms that differ between donor and recipient found on uh, proteins of varying biochemistry, type 1, type 2, type 3, uh, past transmembrane proteins. And almost all of these are, are, are amino acid polymorphisms that are not carbohydrate dependent B cell epitopes. Uh, in the world of platelets, which are a little bit less complex only by the number of antigens, uh, but certainly probably more of a problem from an immunization standpoint, there are HLA antigens which cause uh, problems in a, in a number of uh, varieties, platelet refractoriness to be sure, and also complicating subsequent solid organ transplantation, and also the HPA antigens. And the HPA antigens, very much like blood group antigens, are polymorphisms that are found on the glycoproteins on the surface of platelets, and these can cause uh, problems such as neonatal alimmune thrombocytopenia and, and other issues. So, so the transfusion uh, world has focused on these uh, targets for antibody-mediated sequelae. Now, in transfusion therapy, and, and these are meant to represent platelets and red cells, historically, really, the entire job of the immunohematology service is this process of humoral allele immunization, where antibodies against either the platelets or the red cells subsequently cause a problem. In the case of red cells, hemolytic transfusion reactions can be life-threatening when severe. In the case of platelets, uh, you just don't get a bump in the platelet count. Um, I'm, I'm not sure nothing happens to these patients, but they certainly don't shake in pea black. And so this is, becomes a problem with getting their numbers up, uh, but not with the pathophysiology of the clearance. However, um, there's another arm to be considered, and this is immunization to minor antigens. Now, there is an unfortunate overlapping of nomenclature here. In the immunohematology world, a minor antigen is Kel, Kid, Duffy, whatnot, with an antibody would recognize. In the more basic immunology world, a minor antigen is not the part of the molecule that the B cell uh, epitope or antibody recognizes, but it's the peptide containing the polymorphism presented in the MHC of the recipient, either class two or class one. And so it is this definition of minor antigen uh, that I'm going to be using for the rest of the talk. So when you consider the immunization to minor antigens, um, if you are getting a T cell response, irrespective of a, of a B cell response, it leads to the theoretical possibility that those T cell responses, especially cytolytic T cells, at least canonically, may destroy tissues expressing those minor antigens. And this could, in theory, result in the rejection of uh, either hematopoietic stem cell, bone marrow transplants in general, or in broader cases, solid organ transplantation. Now, I, uh, these are um, broken down into different components of the immune system, to be sure. And what I do, uh, I am, if nothing, a model builder. And we model each of these processes in mice um, and try to bring the powers of murine experimentation to the world of transfusion biology. And uh, for today's talk, I'm going to focus on this side of the pathway, which I hasten to point out would never be detected in the clinical laboratories because there are no immunohematology assays currently that look at this. They are solely and exclusively dedicated to antibody-mediated reactions. So I'm going to talk about a lot of theoretical data today in animal models. And, and to be blunt up front, we don't know if this happens in humans. The correlative data suggests that it does. 
and, and I suspect that it does, but I, we don't know that. Okay, so let's talk about some of the background um, to, to develop the story. As early as 1964, at least, it was appreciated in mice that the transfusion of whole blood between MHC-identical mismatched uh, mice could cause the rejection of a subsequent bone marrow transplant. The data actually probably go back uh, a bit earlier than that if you look at some controls and some papers, but this was the first real uh, uh, thorough description of it. Um, several years later, uh, it, the same phenomenon was observed in non-human primates. And importantly, in these primates, it didn't matter if the blood was from the bone marrow donor or a third party uh, mo uh, monkey. Now, at that time, the MHC was not characterized. They really didn't know the degree of relativity of the colony of the monkeys, but it, 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 so I don't know if there was direct presentation here or not. Subsequently, um, in canine model, uh, models, and, and all of this work was done right here, basically, uh, Rainer Storb, and in collaboration with Cheryl Schlichter, demonstrated the same phenomenon that if you transfuse the dogs before they get a bone marrow transplant, you cause rejection that would not have occurred without the transfusion. And it, like the monkeys, this could either be from DLA identical dogs or third party dogs that were unrelated by MHC. Looking further into this, the same group showed that if you do a uh, kind of a crude leuka reduction at the time, um, a Buffy code leuka reduction where you had fewer than seven times 10 to the fifth white blood cells, this failed to mitigate the phenomenon. The rejection still occurred. But if you got down to fewer than one times 10 to the fifth leukocytes, uh, the, the phenomenon waned, suggesting that it was at least leukocyte dependent, if not antigens expressed by the leukocytes themselves. And sort of consistent with this, it was shown that UV irradiation of the blood product uh, got rid of this problem. Now, in humans, um, obviously, uh, we are ethically bound um, to do things a little bit less of a dissective nature. But uh, it, is, it is now um, well recognized, just therapeutically, that HLA-matched bone marrow transplants are curative for non-malignant hematological disorders, especially of genetic origin. So sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, and even acquired aplastic anemia can be cured by a successful uh, HLA-matched bone marrow transplant, preferably HLA-identical if you can find a matched sibling. And in these case in cases when rejection occurs, the assumption is de facto that it is across minor barriers because the major barriers aren't available because you haven't crossed them. So um, we know in humans that minor antigens can mediate uh, bone marrow transplant rejection. There are the male antigen, there's some MHAs uh, that have been defined. We don't know all of them. And we know that transfusions prior to bone marrow transplant increase the risk of HLA-matched bone marrow. Right, um, these two studies were looking at uh, aplastic anemic patients who had never been transfused, and their rate of successful bone marrow transplantation was much higher. Consistent with the idea, but certainly not demonstrative of it, liars, damn liars, and statisticians. So the problem is, is that the more severe your disease, the more likely you are to get transfusions. The more severe your disease, the more likely you are to reject the marrow. Is it causal from the transfusions, or is the microenvironment of your bone marrow just that much more damaged from your disease, and therefore you're rejecting? So suggestive, but not demonstrative. Um, in these patients suffering the same uh, coincident variable problem, the more transfusions you get, the more likely you are to reject. So also consistent. And like the dog data indicated, the leukocytes were thought to be uh, the offending antigen in this case. However, since the implementation of essentially universal leuka reduction, the rates of rejection of bone marrow transplants in these patients have not decreased. And this is largely looking at the European registry data. Uh, these analyses are done by John Horn at Emory. They're not yet published, uh, suggesting that it's possible that the antigens on non-leukocyte components of the blood are responsible. This is very important because there's a whole industry in blood banking focused on making the ever better leuka reduction filter or filters that can get rid of that last white cell. And if the white cells are responsible, that's quite a reasonable approach. However, if it's antigens on non-white cell components, it matters not how well you make your filter, you've got a different problem to deal with. So we wanted to test this hypothesis in mice. And um, we have a fairly large uh, uh, mouse um, uh, colony going on. And, and the challenge is, how do you model red blood cell transfusion accurately in an animal whose total blood volume is 2 cc's? Um, it's not my intention to be unkind, cruel, or cavalier about animal experimentation, but the simple response is you use a lot of mice. And the reason is, unfortunately, unless you treat the mouse blood precisely as you treat the human blood, you get a different answer biologically. 
So we model lupin reduction of mouse blood in my lab using the same filters that are used on human blood. We exsanguinate mice into CPDA1, and we pass them over a Paul neonatal lupin reduction filter. This is an example in the hood. And we wash the blood, and then we enumerate the leukocytes uh, via a propidium iodide-based assay and flow cytometry. And this is just an example of such staining that uh, this is an unstained control. When you give whole blood, you get the leukocytes. And then after leukoreduction, reduction, it, it drops it down almost to undetectable levels. By our measures, fewer than 500 leukocytes per murine unit, which is an equivalent log reduction to what you would see in human units. They then, we then transfuse a volume-adjusted amount into, into a mouse, so 100 microliters would be the equivalent of a single human unit. So the simple experimental design to begin with is to ask whether the phenomenon exists. And we started with uh, black six mice uh, who are congenic for thigh 1.1, so we can monitor engraftment. And we transfuse them with BAL B mice. So BAL B mice are, are BAL C mice, right, of a very different genetic origin than black six, who have been bred to carry the same MHC as black six, hence BAL B as opposed to BAL C. And the BAL B mice are they're all H2B. So H2 is the mouse MHC locus, and the B superscript suggests the haplotype. So this is an MHC identical minor mismatch model. We transfuse the blood four times, LUCA reduced. We then transplant the bone marrow uh, under uh, 700 rads, which is like a reduced intensity conditioning in mice, and we look at engraftment. This is an example of the nature of the engraftment we see. These are the thigh 1.2 donor cells versus the thigh 1.1 recipients. So when engraftment occurs or rejection occurs, it's not a subtle effect, and we typically get about a 50% 50, 50 engraftment when we get it. So. What we observed in the, in, in the combined, this is a combined uh, experiments, that if you don't give transfusion, or you give transfusion with syngeneic leukoreduced blood products, you get 100% engraftment, but as soon as you give the leukoreduced uh, minor mismatched blood, you get uh, greater than 80% rejection. And this is, um, again, not a nonspecific artifact because the syngeneic blood doesn't do it. And these are the individual data points to look at the percent chimerism uh, going across the animals. So very similar to what was observed in the dogs, if the donor is the same as the, the transfusion donor, same as the bone marrow donor, you get rejection. What about the third party question? So if we modify the experimental design a bit, so now the donors are BALP C, right? So they're mismatched at the minors and the majors. And this is important because whatever direct presentation may happen by the BALP C cells, they won't find their targets on the bone marrow because the bone marrow is, is, is of the same uh, uh, MHC as the recipient. And in this case, we see almost precisely the same phenomenon, that um, four uh, transfusions of the BALB C leukoreduced red cells cause rejection uh, in mice that would not have rejected were they not transfused with that foreign blood. I'm sorry for the static. I have no control over it. All right, so um, one gets into mechanisms of uh, rejection. And obviously, as blood bankers, we are drawn immediately to serological explanations. Um, by using ind indirect immunofluorescence assays, we can fairly uh, have a sensitive measure of anti-MHC antibodies or anti-BALB antibodies, whether they're MHC or not. And with the exception of this one very special mouse, we uh, never failed, we, we never detected uh, antibodies in any of these animals that rejected their bone marrow transplant either before or after the transplant. Now, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, can't tell you the antibodies weren't doing something until later, but right now we could not detect them. Is it actually an immunological response? Very important, or have we done something weird and nonspecific to the mice? So to test the immunological response, we do what we call an in vivo killing assay. We take three different target populations and label them in three different colors. So we use the mouse's own cells, or syngeneic cells, as a control for injection and survival in microenvironment. And then we use target cells that are either BAL B or that are B6H2D to isolate the major HLA component. And we mix them together and transfuse them into a mouse through the tail vein, wait 16 hours, and then recover them from the uh, spleen and look at their survival rates. And uh, this is an example. So uh, in a naive mouse, by flow, you can distinguish these three different target populations. If you take a mouse into which no targets were injected, these gates are empty. So this is specific to the, to the infusion. And if you look at a control animal that was immunized intraperitoneally, so we really hopped up the immune system of this mouse, uh, the syngeneic targets are surviving quite nicely, but there's specific kill of the allogeneic targets against which the mouse has been immunized. So this is a very sensitive assay for in vivo immunity, whether it's antibody mediated or not. And when we do this assay, we found that prior to the bone marrow transplant, this is after the transfusion, prior to the bone marrow transplant, uh, 
you do see a dose-dependent increase in lytic activity, but it is, it's, it's pretty low. And this is important from a mechanistic understanding, because whatever we're doing, it's a, it's a relatively weak stimulus. But this is very important from a laboratory medicine standpoint as well. Because whereas only about 40% of these animals here are demonstrating statistically significant killing of the targets, all of these animals reject their marrow. So that means that even if you were to devise a test of this nature in humans, its predictive power would probably be poor at this point in the process. Now, if you do the same set of experiments after the rejection has occurred, right, on different animals, obviously, because it's a terminal assay, you find that you have essentially 100% kill. So mechanistically, and I'll come back to this again later, these data suggest that the transfusion is doing something, else the rejection would not have occurred, but that the bone marrow transplant itself is also an immunizing event because you see more robust immunity after the rejection has, has taken place. So, you know, somewhat myopically and, and in binary thinking, one comes back to this question, what component is it? Is it the residual leukocyte or the erythrocyte? And uh, we took a kind of a backdoor approach to asking this question by trying to restrict antigen to one species or another. And we generated a novel transgenic mouse, which we call the HOD mouse. HOD is a, it's an acronym for, hen for henoglycosyme H, OVA, O, and D, Duffy. And this antigen expresses henoglycosyme, which is a very well-studied humoral antigen, in-frame fused ovalbumin, which is a well-studied cellular antigen, and then anchored to the membrane with an authentic uh, human erythrocyte blood group antigen. And we chose these uh, particular molecules uh, because there is a panoply of tools uh, to study them in murine systems. This mouse uh, uh, gene is expressed under the um, uh, big LCR of the beta globin gene, so it's a red cell specific regulatory element. And after going through several founders, uh, we have an animal that expresses the sustaining red cells, the HEL epitope, the OVA epitope. It doesn't express Duffy A because it's made with the Duffy B allele. And then Duffy 3, which is the third extracellular loop, is quite detectable. Uh, if you stay in CD45 positive leukocytes or CD41 positive platelets, you do not detect. So the red is the wild type, blue is the transgenic mouse. There's no detectable antigen in those compartments. The yellow is a positive control for the assay. So we have red cell specific expression of our model antigen in the hematopoietic compartment, and it expresses the B cell epitopes that we're interested in, and then there's T cell epitopes I'll talk about in a little bit. So by using blood from this animal, we could begin to ask the question, what is the immune response to a minor antigen restricted to red cells? And um, when you want to look at a T cell response in a naive animal, the precursor frequency is exceedingly low, uh, probably 200 cells at the beginning of the game. And short of doing pull-down uh, assays, uh, as with Mark Jenkins, the uh, best approach to analyze these cells is to use TCR transgenic mice. Now, the TCR transgenic mice express a T cell receptor for a given antigen, and it's the same T cell receptor on every cell in their body. They're not useful in themselves. If you transfuse them, they basically explode from an immunological standpoint. But what you can do is adoptively transfer small numbers of these cells into a wild-type mouse, and therefore have a, a naive precursor frequency that you can analyze. And so the experimental setup then was to take black six mice, give them OT1 splenocytes. Now, OT1 splenocytes recognize a peptide from ovalbumin, which is in the which is in our transgene, presented by K of B, which is a mouse MHC1. So if, the, and then give the mice the transfusion and look at the response. The, um, the mice that we're transfusing from are FVB, so they're of a different MHC type than the recipients. And the upshot of that is if you see activation of these T cells, it demonstrates cross-presentation of the red cell antigen into the class one pathway of the recipient and activation of the recipient's CDA T cells. And that's precisely what we saw. So if you look at the number of OT1 T cells in the recipient mouse, it got just the FEB blood. This is the, the control blood. This is the baseline. You give the HOD blood, be it leukoreduced or not, you get a, a significant expansion of the CDA T cells. These are what the flow plots look like. We're gating on tetramer-positive cells. So this tells us the antigen specificity of the cells via CD8. And um, there's different mechanisms by which one can get increased numbers, certainly increased proliferation, decreased apoptosis and whatnot. But if you CFSE label the cells first um, to make them green and then look at their proliferation as a result of diluting the CFSE out, uh, it becomes obvious that when you give the hot blood, uh, leukoreduced reduced or not, that you get clear division of these populations. So these data indicate to us that even though, you know, red cell antigens are thought of as an antibody-inducing response, uh, 
a red cell antigen can be cross-primed by a recipient antigen-presenting cell into the class one pathway and induce a CDA T cell response capable of recognizing that antigen MHC complex. Um, this led us to hypothesize that this is what was happening with our blood units and that that's why we were getting rejection because of these CDA T cells. Uh, to close the loop though and trying to sh and test that functionally, um, you can't really do a, the experiment where you transfuse with hot blood and then transplant with hot marrow because the hot antigen doesn't come up in erythropoiesis and it's not present on stem cells. So this approach would not answer the question uh, or even test the question. But what you can do is use the MOVA mouse, which was created by Mark Jenkins, that expresses uh, ovalbumin on all of its cells as a target for rejection. So the experimental design is you give hot red cells that contain the ovalbumin antigen, then you transplant with MOVA marrow and you see if you get rejection. And the hypothesis is that, that these cells will cross pyme endogenous CD8s and cause rejection in that animal. So I can, I can honestly say um, that I'm not biased in this approach because we got exactly the opposite of what I predicted, which is normally what occurs in my laboratory with great frequency. And so if you give the animal uh, multiple transfusions of the hot blood or the FEB blood, you get essentially no rejection. That's not because this peptide cannot serve as a rejection vector because if you infect the mouse with polyoma virus that contains that peptide, the bone marrow rejects rather nicely. It's capable of rejecting, it's just not rejecting. And you can give inflammation and innate activation by co-infecting with the hot blood, and even if you do that, you don't, get, you don't get rejection of the bone marrow. So this, at first glance, appears to contradict what we're observing with our TCR transgenic approach. So we asked the question, well, are we ever getting any CD8 T cells in the endogenous animal? And so what you're looking at here is a, a time course where we give repeat transfusions, and then we stain the cells with the synfecal tetramer. Synfecal is a peptide from ovalbumin, and we just, because it's pronounceable, it's the only one we just say. The rest of them would be more, it's harder to <clears throat> communicate. So we stain with the synfecal tetramer by CD8. You can see the natural response coming up. So if we infect with the polyoma ova-containing virus, this is the natural uh, tetramer response, which is weird for a viral response, but this is a chronic virus that does weird things. And uh, you look at, despite repeated hot transfusions, you never see that tetramer positive population coming up, consistent with you never getting bone marrow transplant rejection. Which brings us back to the question, well, what in God's name is going on with those OT1 T cells? Well, that's easy. TCR transgenic mice are artificial. It's an artifact. It's not real. The pre precursor frequency is too high. Their affinity is too high but how to try to make sense of it all. And so um, in those uh, experiments we did with the OT1s, we really only looked at that early time point to see if proliferation was happening. But if you take those things out further, suddenly it all comes together and makes sense. So this is the, an OT1 cells where we adoptively transfer, and then we give them different stimuli. And if you give them, uh, in this case, a polyoma overexpressing virus, as is more normal, they expand, and then they, they collapse to some, but their set point to which they collapse is well above where they started. And what you're viewing here is the beginning of a memory uh, population. If you give the hot red cells, with or without inflammation, you see expansion, just like you do with a virus, and then it collapses down to a level below where it started, uh, partially through an apoptotic mechanism. I don't have time to go into it. We've done a, a fairly good phenotypic characterization of these cells, and to the best of our ability to determine they're being deleted. So now it all comes together. This actually argues that antigens on an erythrocyte are at best non-immunogenic in this particular pathway. These red cells induce antibody responses, by the way, while all this is happening, so. And maybe actually tolerogenic uh, in this context, and it's consistent. The OT1 T cells all get deleted. You never see the natural response coming up by tetramers. You do not induce bone marrow transplant rejection. Well, um, <clears throat> perhaps Dr. Schlichter will agree that there is more to blood than leukocytes and red cells. And uh, we began to turn our attention to platelets because despite our leukoreduction filters, which are very thorough, variable numbers of platelets come through. Their numbers certainly decrease, but not, not to zero by any means. And so we um, have devised a similar method where we isolate uh, mouse platelets. Uh, we collect the, um, the platelets. We, we do platelet-rich plasma through differential centrifugation. We pass them over a neonatal platelet leukoreduction filter. We learned our lesson not to use the red cell filter. Uh, we get lots of platelets out, and, and these platelets are, are very clean. Um, there, there are lots of platelets present. They're essentially undetectable 
uh, red cells, TER119 is a red cell marker, very few, if any, lymphocytes. If we transfuse these platelets, uh, they have a normal circulatory lifespan in the recipients, and they will aggregate in response to collagen. So the best of our ability to determine these platelets are functioning normally, and, and we model a human platelet leukoreduction in this way. So um, to get right to the point, if you use these platelets in the same experimental design I've, I've talked about so far, you get precisely the same result. So um, the BAL-B leukoreduced platelets in a naive mouse where engraftment occurs, if you give the BAL-B platelets, you get rejection. If you give the BAL-C platelets, you give rejection. This is not a nonspecific effect of some platelet transfusion-induced biology because when you give syngin A platelets, you don't get the rejection. So perhaps this is the culprit that we're looking for. We, again, uh, looked in this system um, and did not detect an antibody response. So if you, um, the white here are leukocyte targets, the, the gray here are platelet targets, and a positive control on some mice that we have, we have ways of getting them immune to bowel minor antigens. But if you compare uh, the syngenaic mice that don't reject uh, to the mice that do reject, there is not a statistical significant level of antibody detection. Again, I can't ever reject a negative. I can't tell you zero, but it's, it's fairly unimpressive. And after the bone marrow transplant, it, it, it's zero in our ability to detect. If we do the in vivo killing assay, as I described to you again, um, we get the same type of result. This is post-transfusion, pre-bone marrow transplant, and what you see is a variable kill in the animals that got the foreign platelets and not uh, the syngenetic platelets. So, the, the platelet-rich plasma preparations are behaving very much as were the red cell leukoreduced uh, units, except they don't have the red cells in them. Mechanistically, um, we were trying to figure out what was going on because uh, one would hypothesize this is a T cell mediated process, especially it gets its minor antigens of this nature, and because we don't detect antibodies. And so we did depletion studies. Um, if you take these mice that, that uh, are rejecting, and um, uh, sorry, these are engrafting, they're, they're naive mice, but if you take mice and treat them with anti-CD4, you get rid of all the rejection that does occur when an isotype match control antibody is given. If you deplete the mice of CD8 T cells, you see the same thing. This is a depletion post-transfusion pre-bone marrow transplantation. So the implication here is that both CD4 and CD8 T cells are necessary for rejection to occur at this point in the evolution of the immune system. Um, if you take MUMT recipients, and these mice uh, have the inability to make antibodies, in fact, they're lacking B cells altogether, um, these MUMT recipients uh, still reject marrow at a, a similar rate to wild type. A couple of them failed, but, but the vast majority of them reject. And so along with the failure to detect antibodies, these mice demonstrate that antibodies are not required for this rejection to occur. Again, I can't tell you they're not playing some subtle role. Antibodies are not required. Both CD4s and CD8s are. This gives rise to a couple different hypotheses. Um, so if the platelet is being cross-primed into an APC and it's activating recipient CD4s and CD8s, it's possible that the CD8s need help from the CD4s uh, in order to become the final effector that kills the reaction. Although CD4s are not known for this function, there have been effector CD4 T cells described that can kill targets. So it's also possible that both of them uh, have to kill targets. And, and this is an interesting idea here because um, if you look at the CD8 T cell literature on primary activation, you don't need CD4 T cells to mount an initial lytic response. You, they're called helpless cells, and you may get different memory effects. But the initial response is not required. But all of those data are generated with viral infections, with a lot of innate immune signals and TLR agonists, and a very robust response. Any transfusion, if it's done properly, and by that I mean you don't have a bunch of microbes growing in your bag, uh, is going to have a qu quantitatively uh, decreased innate immune activation. So to try to distinguish these two possibilities, we set up a slightly more complicated experimental system, where instead of using BAL-B donors, we're using BAL-B by black 6 f ones so they express both groups, but they express the foreign antigen. And we just learned through empirical observation that these behave very much like the pure bell Bs. If, if you give them the F1, they, they induce rejection. And the reason we did this is we have two different crosses. We have bell B by black 6 F1s, and then we also have bell B by black 6 thi 1.1 F1s. 
so that we can do retransplant experiments and distinguish between the first transplant and the second transplant. So basically what we do is we transfuse the mice with our, our leucoreduce platelets. We irradiate them and give them a transplant with the BAL B by BLAC6. We look at engraftment. We take the mice that reject it. We let them reject. Then we deplete. And then we give them a second transplant to see what the T cell requirements are during the immunization event that the bone marrow transplant appears to consist of. And the question is, are the CD4 T cells just necessary for help at the beginning, or are they necessary all the way throughout? And what we have observed here, and these are the mice that are rejecting. So we take just the mice that reject, and then we do the depletion retransplant. Now, if you deplete CD8s, you get engraftment. But if you deplete CD4s, you still get rejection. So after the transplant has occurred, the CD4s are no longer required. And basically, these data reject the hypothesis that the CD4s are effectors that are also necessary with the CD8s and supports a model where the CD4s are necessary for help early on and for, in order for the CD8 response to fully mature. And it's a bit strange because uh, it argues that the transfusion with the platelets are a priming event, but not pushing us to full maturity. So this is the leading hypothesis right now on how this is happening. And let me just go over the observations a little bit that rejection does not occur if the transfusion is not given. Okay, so this indicates to us that something is happening to the immune system in response to the transfusion. The in vivo killing is variable uh, after the transfusion and prior to the BMT, but uniformly high after the BMT. And the conclusion there is that the bone marrow transplant is in of itself an immunizing event that causes it sort of to, to tip over to the edge. Now, what are the conclusions here? Well, one might hypothesize that the transfusion primes a response, uh, uh, but the BMT in is, is in of itself the, the real immunizing event. And the hypothesis this gives rise to is that, one, the transfusion might induce CD8 T cells into a, um, a sort of a pseudo-effector state where they're pre-CTLs. And there are people who tell you that such things don't exist, and there are people who tell you that they do. Um, but it's possible that they've partially differentiated, and then the bone marrow transplant pushes them to the full effector state so that they're now capable of actually rejecting the marrow. Alternatively, it's simply a numbers game. And that the transfusion does give you mature CTLs, but the precursor frequency is too low uh, in order for the bone marrow transplant to occur. I favor the former hypothesis and not the latter. And the basis for that opinion is that it doesn't matter how many transfusions we give these mice. We always need the bone marrow transplant to get rid of the CD4 T cell dependence. If it was just a numbers game, you would predict that with boosting and priming and boosting and boosting and boosting, you'd ultimately get there and you don't. But that's, that's more speculative than, than um, clear cut. But this is where we are on understanding the, the effector mechanisms here. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to digress for a minute to um, some observations we've made with our initial attempts to translate a interventional therapy into this situation. Um, CTLA-4IG is a co-stimulatory blockade drug that is now used in humans for several different indications. So if you take a minute back just to the basic T cell activation biology, for in order for a T cell, and I'm sorry that they're red, which is a poor choice with this topic, I guess, but in order for a T cell to recognize, to differentiate, recognizing a peptide MHC complex is not enough. This is what is affectionately referred to as signal one. And when this occurs, a T cell also needs co-stimulation. And there's a, there's a whole panoply of different co-stimulatory molecules that have been described, but the canonical molecule will be the B7 CD28 axis. If this occurs, you get an effector cell. In the absence of co-stimulation, it's not just that nothing occurs, you, you get a, a, a tolerogenic pathway. You either get an energic cell, you, in some settings you can get a Treg, you can get apoptosis. So um, a number of groups for over a decade had said, all right, maybe we can cause tolerance instead of immunity by blocking co-stimulation. And they cloned uh, basically CTLA-4, which is an alternate receptor for B7, and fused it to an IgG FC domain to give it circulation solu uh, solubility and, and stability. And if you infuse this into an animal, you can block uh, co-stimulation and cause tolerance where otherwise you would have gotten immunity. Uh, CTLA-4-IG is now FDA approved for use in humans in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and recently approved in the treatment of solid organ transplantation with kidneys combined with other therapies. It is, nothing is unequivocally safe, um, but as a monotherapy, CTLA-4 uh, is very safe. And one of the reasons is that this is, what you're looking at here is a diagram for a naive T cell. 
Memory T cells for established immunity have a much lower threshold for co-stimulatory requirements to activate and differentiate. So when you get CTLA-4IG, all of your previous immunity, your vaccination status, all of the pathogens that you've already cleared, those responses remain intact. It's only blocking naive responses to new antigens. In the field of transfusion, we have a unique opportunity because we know precisely when you encounter those new antigens because we do it to you. So I can report that in mice, the use of CTLA-4IG as a monotherapy completely protects against the biology that we're studying here. So this is a naive animal. This is an animal who's, who's a positive control for rejection. If you CTLA-4 treat the animals that are getting platelet transfusions, you don't get 100% engraftment, but it's pretty darn good. And mice that get an IgG1 control for nonspecific effects all go ahead and reject. So this is a single CTLA-4 IG transfu uh, infusion given at day zero, with then repeat transfusions uh, up to four weeks, and then engraftment analysis. This is an interesting question because in the previous experiment, we gave CTLA-4 IG at day zero, and then the bone marrow transplant never rejected, but it's got a long half-life. So how do you know that instead of it actually preventing immunization of transfusion, it's just not preventing bone marrow transplant rejection and would have done so uh, regardless of what you were doing. So we changed our experimental design on day zero. Um, we just give our transfusions for four days. Then we give our CTLA-4IG at the time of bone marrow transplant. So let the, whatever the priming that the transfusion is doing, let it happen. Then give the CTLA-4IG. And this is also very important from a clinical standpoint. If this works, don't worry about preventing immunization of the platelets. There's no real worries. You just hit them at the time of bone marrow transplant, and you'll overcome what you've previously done. So regrettably, from a practical standpoint, but illuminating from an experimental standpoint, um, this does not prevent rejection. So if you give CTLA-4IG at day 28, you still get the same rejection as the isotype mass control. And this actually begins to feed back into our understanding from the CD4 depletion studies that um, Whatever's happening here uh, appears to be a priming event, and once the analogy, once the horses are out of, out of the barn, um, it, it's not to be undone by these types of measures. So um, I'm going to come uh, to the conclusions now, and, and uh, also talk about future directions that we see these things going. Um, I think we can safely conclude, at least in mice, that minor antigens on transfused blood products induce rejection of subsequent transplants. And we reject the notion that the trends seen are simply a matter of the patients getting more transfusions, having more severe hematological illness that messes up their bone marrow microenvironment, because these experiments are done on animals who have no bone marrow disease. Again, mice are not humans, and we're very mindful of that. Um, we are launching, and by launching, it's in, it's in a fairly infant state, a genetics-based identification of the minor antigens that are responsible. Um, luckily, mice are easy to breed, they have a high fecundity and a short gestational life span. So by back-crossing the mismatched mice onto a black six background, we can do GWAS studies in the mice and try to identify the precise antigens that are responsible. Why would you want to do this? Um, well, this type of knowledge would give us the ability um, one, to generate assays that could um, predict what might be going on. And again, the, we're not going to do in vivo killing assays on humans, obviously, but it's not inconceivable that tetramer-based assays on circulating blood would be meaningful. But also, um, you, might, you might think that this is like the worst nightmare ever from a matching standpoint. I mean, we have a hard enough time matching blood products now for the antigens we know. Don't give us all these other additional things that, by the way, we can't detect uh, by serological methods, and, and now it's never going to happen. But I would take a guess and, and, and hear that the number of antigens are relatively few. Um, when we do male-female uh, combinations like this, it causes rejection as well, and that's just two peptides. In order for a minor antigen to cause rejection in the setting, it has to be expressed both on mature blood products and on hematopoietic precursors. And I would guess that the number of minor antigens that are going to be mismatched and fulfill those criteria are going to be a lot less than the total number. It's also possible that this pathway is present in solid organ transplantation. There, the minor antigen would have to be matched on the transfused blood and the organ, right? So certainly blood group antigens are expressed on different organs. And so I think that's, a, that's an open question, which we have not investigated. <laughs>
I think at this point, we're starting to unravel the story, but the exact cellular uh, components uh, responsible for the immunization are not yet clear. Um, obviously, our, our thinking at this point is it's not the red cells, and it's likely the platelets. But remember, there's always these pesky white cells around, and it's hard to determine what's going on. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but we are, we are very close to completing a mouse that uses Cree locks, uh, basically a lock stop locks technology to allow conditional expression of our model antigens on different strains. And so we have strains that have selective Cree expression on red cells and platelets and different leukocyte subsets. And so we can begin to do a genetic manipulation to isolate the antigen to different components of the blood and, and look at them in combination with purification. The problem is, is that no matter how well you try to do a physical separation of the different subsets, you always wind up with impurities. Now, you may say to me, no matter how well you regulate transgenic mice, you always get leakage, and that would be true too. But I'm, I'm hopeful that this system will really illuminate uh, what's going on. Um, in our laboratory, we have made the observation, and these observations were largely made by Jeannie Hendrickson, that when you store blood, it is a very different immunogen than when you use it fresh. Uh, red cells, in particular, are profoundly immunogenic when stored and, and weakly immunogenic when fresh. We need to apply those criteria here. It's been a long time, at least in America, since we've done a, a real transfusion with the donor and the recipient laying next to each other on a cot a tube going between them. Um, clearly, sitting in a bag in the refrigerator for 42 days in the absence of calcium is not a natural state for human tissues, uh, nor is rocking back and forth for seven or five days on a, on a warm bed. And I think that building those components into the system is going to be absolutely necessary to understand what's going on here. Um, I'm going to advocate co-stimulatory blockade as a, as a potential intervention here. Now, uh, people will, will say you're trying to drop an atom bomb on an anthill, um, that the dangers of immunosuppression are not warranted given the risks of immunization. And I would agree with you if the vast majority of patients especially those who have a motor vehicle accident are not likely to be transfused again. However, I would argue in patients necessitating chronic transfusion who risk refractory status where you cannot control their uh, hemostasis by transfusion, and in patients awaiting a transplant uh, who you may damage substantially um, by immunizing before they get the organ, that in those select patient populations, uh, it is worth the risk, that the ctla 4 ig is safe, that it causes increased colds and increased um, nasopharyngeal infections, and otherwise it's a, it's a very, very benign treatment in these patients. So um, we've taken, in this, this is human ctla 4 ig by the way, which, which responds well with the mouse uh, epitope, and um, it is a goal slash fantasy uh, to find a way to test these hypotheses in humans, and I think we can do it. It would basically be an off-label use. Let me tell you, I have neither professional nor personal relationships with Bristol-Myers Squibb. I get no personal remuneration from this drug whatsoever, but I do believe it's an elegant approach. So I have been extremely fortunate um, to work with a great number of very selfless and talented people uh, in my laboratory at Emory, and many of these um, faces have gotten their doctorates and moved on to greener pastures. These uh, work that you're looking at today was carried out in large part by uh, Seema Patel, who is just a um, a force of nature. Um, I liken her to a freight train. There's, there's no stopping her. Uh, she would have bankrupted the lab had she not graduated. Um, Chris Gilson um, has also made substantial contributions to these work, but really I've been fortunate to have a very integrated group of people who selflessly and, and collaboratively work together. Um, again, I'm honored by the invitation, and I thank you for your attention. Time for questions. Dr. Sabbath. So Jim, that was very nice. Um, just sort of a, a, I'm just curious, how long does CTLA 4 IG hang out in the circulation? I mean, is, is it comparable to, say, an antibody like a toxin, which is there for a really, really long time, or is it a fairly short half life? It's got a fairly good half life, um, about seven days or so. And it has an added benefit, which is really clever. These are foreign substances, and even if they're humanized, they still have junction points. And so one always worries about making an antibody response to the therapy that's being used. But the clever thing about ctl 4 ig is it inhibits the antibody response against itself. So you can use this thing, use this thing chronically, and it has, it has a fairly stable half-life, which, again, is experimentally complicated because you want to do washout experiments to see 
we don't know whether we're inducing long-term tolerance here with that initial dose, right, or whether it's just hanging around. And waiting six months for it to clear from a mouse is really rather boring. So we're in the process of, we, we're not doing, we're designing, we'd like to do transfer experiments where we wash it out and see what the long-term status of that is. Um, I haven't gone into the data, but as you might imagine, because we have the TCR transgenics here that recognize uh, the hot antigen, and also the ova, we have platelets with ova on their surface, we can start to look at both class one and class two responses, phenotype those cells, traffic those cells, and see if we're actually inducing tolerance or not. And I think that's going to be a critical, critical question. Dr. Murphy? So, um, make sure to repeat the question. That's okay. Okay. There can't be that many targets. Uh, and so if you look in the, if you think the platelets are the candidates, I'm, you could compare the SNPs from black six and BELP-C mice for platelet proteins. Do you know how big that that would be? How many proteins you you're talking about? So the question is, what degree of variation is there on the platelet proteins expressed by these animals, and would that narrow the scope of what the antigens might be? Um, I, I don't. I mean, both mice have been completely sequenced. We, proteomics on platelets have given us a fair idea. Um, the uh, F1s reject very robustly, so it, it, it's not a, just a dose effect issue. And I think that's a very logical approach to go at it. Um, having been raised by classical uh, immunogeneticists, um, what I imagine is back crossing them uh, to the black six to isolate the minimal necessary antigens and then doing the genetic analysis. Uh, but what you, see, what you suggest is certainly worthwhile doing up front. You know, there's, there's a SNP every couple hundred base pairs. Now, they're not necessarily encoding regions. They may not be non-synonymous. Unlike antibody responses, you need no strange change in the tertiary structure here. And the SNP can be transmembrane or intracellular or what have you because, of, you know, MHC is not going to make a distinction. So I, I really don't know. But I can tell you based upon the male system, right, so male antigen, which is just two amino acids, all you need is two peptide differences to induce rejection in the animals. So it may be a very small number. Dr. Drum. So the duration of the tolerance is induced by CPLA4? Right. So I can't, you know, first of all, I don't know that it's tolerance. If it's sticking around, it simply may be blocking initiation uh, going on. And so um, what we have to do is, is uh, give it in wait until it clears and then try again and see what happens. It can be difficult. You, you could, just because it's clearing from the circulation, though, doesn't mean that it's not bound to the APCs, right? So the experiments we favor are, are putting in cells we can track, activating them, transfusing the presence of CTLA4IG, recovering those cells, and then parking them into a naive animal that's never encountered the CTLA4IG, and doing re-stimulation of them. Uh, it's a critical question. Yeah, well, part of your diagram, of course, is the possible induction of Tregs, which then might be a long-term effect, which Absolutely. is very important to know. If it's a deletional program, like we're seeing with the red cells, you would probably get a temporary tolerance, per se, but then new thymic immigrants would, re would ultimately repopulate the ability to respond. And if you're in a window waiting transplantation, that may or may not, and depending on your age and your thymus, that may or may not uh, be a factor. So it, not just Tregs, it could be, yeah, it could be any of these things. And so um, we do have some of Radinsky's, or had uh, FOXP3 GFP mice, and then the goal would be to back cross those onto our transgenics and look at that although that, those experiments get complicated, too. I think um, if we can get to the point where we can visualize the Tetramer normal population coming up, we have not yet done the experiment where we get platelet, 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 platelet. Do you see a normal endogenous Tetramer response coming up? That's next on the drawing board. If we see that, then the experiments you're asking for become much more easily done. Question? In defense of the platelet, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been doing platelet transfusion immunogenic transfusions for a long time. And we were clearly worried, Jim, whether or not the platelet itself was immunogenic and that, as you have suggested, just doing something with the white cells wouldn't take care of our problem. But in fact, at least in our experiments, and we do transfusion experiments in a dog model, mainly because the Hutch, as you indicated, had done transfusion experiments in the dog model, uh, I'm sorry, bone marrow transplant experiments in the dog model because it predicts what happens in humans. And uh, we have not been able, we, we either can prevent alloimmunization to platelets.
either by filtering the platelets and then removing residual white cells by centrifugation or filtering the platelets and then exposing it to a pathogen reduction process which uh, UV irradiates, adds a agent which binds DNA and RNA and can completely prevent alloimmunization with either of those processes. Now we have done some experiments where we have actually done uh, skin transplant from uh, dogs who are tolerized because some of these dogs once you give the treated transfusions followed by standard transfusions they in fact are tolerized to the standard transfusions from the initial platelets of the treated donor but also uh, in a relatively high percentage from third-party donors that they've never seen before so at least in our situation we don't find the platelets themselves to be immunogenic and in the early days with Dr. Storb we had huge arguments about whole blood versus platelets and he was convinced that you know platelets were as immunogenic as whole blood and we had some experiments in the dog in the past that we never published because Reiner refused to have it published that platelets may be different than whole blood so I, I'm just in the situation that we're dealing with we don't find platelets themselves to be immunogenic most of our experiments would suggest it's still the contaminating white cell so um, thank you uh, for your comments. Obviously, this is something we cannot, uh, we don't have the power to reject in our current system. And this is precisely why we are making the conditional mouse where we can express a foreign antigen selectively on platelets, T cells, B cells, what have you. But let me, let me address the question, which was uh, somewhat, um, I can't, I can't re recapitulate, I'm sorry. Um, let me address the question uh, that this is, a, this is a complicated landscape with, with differing methodology. So the initial Kleist paper, Right, which showed the centrifugation, the removal of the platelets, and you remove the immunogenicity. And the follow-up papers by K.J. Kao, where he was doing those very, very elegant studies in mice, um, those, those were, were, were quite uh, uh, almost demonstrative experiments. At the same time, you know, John Semple and Alan Lazarus, who have been doing the platelet-specific antigen restimulation experiments in vitro, are, they get a different answer. And, and I'm very mindful of the fact that when K.J. Kao was doing those experiments, and he was UV irradiating the products, right. and he was getting tolerance. But he wasn't getting tolerance when he wasn't UV irradiating. Now, let me take a step back and, and, and remember that all of these experiments are looking at antibodies. Yeah. All of these yeah. experiments all these experiments are looking at antibodies. And what we're observing here is an antibody-independent process. So the biology may be very distinct. In addition, the treatments you, you have demonstrated yourself, and KJ has demonstrated as well, that if you UV irradiate them, you get a slightly different answer than if you don't. And depending on how you get different, you know, John Semple's data with, with, with the B cell selective suggests that the leukocyte subset composition of the product gives you a different answer. And so I think that to try to give an overarching hypothesis to explain all the data at this point is grouping together too many divergent variables. Um, this is simply what, what we've observed. But, I, but what you're saying is absolutely true, and I think that this is an unresolved question that we need to we really need to get at. And although the mice are certainly mice, um, they are the only system where we have the genetic power to really try to dissect that. And so that's, that's exactly where we're going, and, and that's spot on. Thank you.